Uh, this is the presentation about uh, the Osmocom BTS hardware support, which is a presentation I am doing together with Alexander, who is, ah, it's right in front. I was looking at you where you were sitting before. It's like, oh, the chair is empty. Where is he going? He's right here. Yeah, so I'm going to do the introductory part and talk about mostly the, the more classic BTSs. And then Alexander is taking over for the Osmo TRX related BTSs because that's uh, really his. Uh, where he has way, way more information or way more uh, understanding than I have. So I have tried to draw uh, a slide or a graph using my favorite slide drawing tool uh, called Dot, um, or Dotty, and I tried to show all the different supported BTS models. So actually, um, it's it's too wide to really put, even with this writing on a single slide, but this is basically all the different uh, BTSs that we support, uh, try to fit that on one slide. It, this is also already in the wiki, I, I already put it in the Osmocom wiki so they can, can review it in more detail. So, um, in general we have two classes of BTSs that we support. We have the classic E1, T1 based BTSs that are illustrated there, and we have the IP based BTSs on the left hand side. Most people are these days, of course, focusing on IP based BTSs, but still I'd like to include those E1 based because there might actually still be some use uh, because you can get quite uh, professional grade E1 based BTSs uh, second hand uh, very inexpensively these days. And that's also where we started. So we started with E1, T1 based BTSs um, and we have support for basically three different vendors or dialects of the Avis interface. Um, I'm not claiming we can support all the Siemens or all the Ericsson base stations or all the Nokia ones, but these are sort of the models that we have successful testing with. And particularly in the Ericsson case, I'm quite convinced that almost all of the RBS 2000 BTSs should work because they all have the same protocol architecture. And in terms of advantages or disadvantages, if we look at this, um, right, um, on the pro side for these old E1, T1 uh, based devices, well, you get them very inexpensively from decommissioned sites. And that doesn't mean, I mean, you have to chase individual uh, people who deinstall or decommission BTSs, but there's an entire market and there are uh, suppliers uh, uh, such as Shields E or PowerStorm or however they're called, basically companies that do nothing else but t sell uh, refurbished or secondhand gr telecom grade equipment and they have huge databases and catalogs what they have currently in stock and so on. So, and you can get like really large capacity. So, um, up to 12 TRX, which I think no uh, uh, IP based BTS that I know supports, whether open source or not. Um, you can get really high RF output power uh, built into the devices themselves. As I said, you can get like 40 or even more watts. A rugged mechanical build, high mean time to failure. Of course, they're also used and they you know, that may, might, might not always be an advantage because, well, they, they've been running for quite some time. Anyway, yeah, on the con side, well, it's a bit antiquated. Not many people are s familiar with the technology uh, even to, let's say, install E1, T1 lines and to debug them and to analyze issues. And it's, it's not so nice. Also, in terms of interfaces, um, you just don't have an E1 port on your laptop. Um, and uh, even in a lot of embedded devices, if you think of uh, very popular embedded Linux devices, nothing has anything where you have an E1 port. So you end up having to have a device that has PCI Express slots and have to have PCIe cards for, for the E1 interface. So it, it's uh, not that nice. Power consumption also tends to be really high, of course, because it's old equipment. Uh, where efficiency was not such a key aspect and also the, the technology was not as advanced to have that efficiency. And then also the very old models, like the Siemens PS11, for example, they don't have ePRS, so there's no 8PSK support or no AMR codec because the, the design of these devices predates uh, adaptive multi-rate. So how does this actually look like? I have to bring this up. Uh, a lot of people will know it already, but this is actually two Siemens PS11 base stations at the Hacking at Random Camp 2009. And this is the professional antenna installation. <laughs> <laughs> No red tape here, um, no pun intended. Oh. Um, and so, well, that's basically was the first uh, deployment of OpenBT, uh, OpenBSC uh, in in uh, at the Hacking at Random Camp uh, 2009. And here you can see all the the cabling coming down from the antennas. So we had an E1 backhaul of a Cat5 cable to OpenBSC running in a tent. I'm not showing the tent. Um, so. Um, we have some other devices that we support over time. There's the RBS2308, for example. There's many other RBS2000 models, um, also RBS2111. And this is actually a picture uh, like you can find it on eBay right now today um, for, I think, like 
300 500 dollars or so and it has 40 rx already inside you know it's a pretty good uh, price point uh, there's of course the ips nano bcs this is an old one there's more modern ones and that's already getting into the ip based world so yes they're poe enabled and so on you can deploy them you can get them in gprs only or eGPRS enabled models uh, band specific and so on and so on but of course like all the previous ones i described the bts and or well, in this case, the PCU is also inside, it's proprietary, and not everybody has been quite happy with that for all kinds of reasons, and the number one reason even is that lots of crashes and no way to fix it. So, um, yeah, but it is one supported option. Also, there's no fully dynamic channels, um, which we support in, in the Osmo BTS-based devices these days, so uh, some some features. then. You have lots of Sysmo VTS devices. I don't want to talk too much about them. It's like the different devices we have and the capabilities, um, which, as we have described before, use Osmo VTS and Osmo PCU. There's something from a company called Neuran, the Neuran, Neuran Light Cell 1.5, which is a 10 watt 2 TRX outdoor VTS, um, which has a specific port of Osmo VTS. It's called the Osmo VTS Light Cell 15, um, because we don't want dots in the executable names. Um, which interfaces with the uh, proprietary physical layer um, uh, uh, using a shared memory queue, and we have Osmo PCU, which pretty much does the same um, in in that device. And this is in in master mainline of the repository, so this is not some fork of the code, but it is on Git Osmo org. There is Octasic um, boards. Uh, this basically it's it uh, various different uh, basically SDR boards with. Uh, um, proprietary physical layer running in a in an octasic specific dsp um, we actually uh, uh, have a port of osmo vts that can run of that that's the osmo vts oct file if you've ever seen that somewhere by in compiling or configuring the code um, it talks over unix domain socket to the osmo pcu for gprs support and there's a series of different boards um, which have different like number of dsps number of radio interfaces and so on uh, you can check uh, the manufacturer if that's something that you're interested in as far as i know maybe i'm wrong and please correct me if i'm wrong eGPRS is not working yet uh, due to some issues with the integration um, on on the pcu side is that correct uh, um, philip yeah 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 okay that's still the case. Also, I think not all voice codecs are supported, uh, the GSM supports at the moment, but otherwise it is uh, like any other Osmo BTS supported device. And that's where I'm coming to my end of file and handing over to Alexander for the Osmo TRX and Osmo BTS TRX supported devices. Okay, um, yeah, so now let's talk about software defined radio or a uh, more DIY way of uh, playing with, uh, with Asmacom and all the way to, to production. So, uh, for those who uh, don't know what software defined radio is, so software defined radio is the easiest way to describe that it's a sound card for radio waves. So the same way a sound card takes digital signal on your computer, produces you know signal uh, sound waves. Software defined radio takes digital signals in your computer and it produces radio waves. That's the basic way how it works. So uh, the way it uh, interfaces with uh, the Osmocom stack is that. Um, so you have this uh, hardware, which is software-defined radio, right? And it is talking to the radio part of the system. And on the other hand, it is uh, taking the digital signal into computer and uh, talking to all of this uh, software um, on the computer where UHD is uh, a driver, basically, which is 
working with uh, multiple versions of software defined radios and then providing a single API uh, to a software called Osmo TRX. And Osmo TRX is implementing uh, what's called like layer zero or lower, lower layer one, which is basically doing modulation, demodulation, and producing bursts of, of um, of soft beats, then they are going to Osmo BTS, which is implementing layer one, layer two. And uh, after Osmo BTS, it's uh, the same familiar Osmo Com stack as with uh, with every other uh, with every other architecture. So uh, a small overview of uh, SDR hardware. Uh, available currently uh, for for Osmo TRX. So two most popular, uh, by my personal assessment, uh, looking at the like mailing list and talking to people. So is uh, our Yumterix, which was designed specifically for GSM. And by the way, um, uh, a laboratory version of this is open source hardware with all the sources published. So um, it's um, open source. Uh, hardware device. And the second one is a USRP B200, which is just a very popular um, software defined radio in general. That's why many people are using it with Osmocom, just because they, they, they already have it. And there is a bunch of others, like USRP1 was the very first one um, ever used for, 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 for GSM, now no longer uh, manufactured and sold. And then uh, there is like USERP N200, which are more, more expensive, usually used in, in laboratories. Embedded devices, recently Lime SDR uh, was supported, which is a new USB-based uh, low-cost SDR. So Xtrix, which is uh, uh, a new generation of uh, SDR we are developing currently, it uh, will be available soon. Uh, so, and answering to two popular questions, so Blade RF and Hack RF are not supported currently for different reasons. Hack RF is half duplex, so it's not possible to support it because base station must be full duplex. Uh, Blade RF technically uh, should work, but there is uh, there was no work done to actually you know implement it in Osmo TRX, So patches are welcome if if there are Blade RF funds. Um, no, welcome to submit uh, patches for this. So, uh, if you're looking to uh, to get uh, a new uh, SDR for for you, so there are several parameters uh, you should be looking for and should understand uh, to make sure uh, you are um, you are getting what you're expecting. So, the most important part and the biggest issues you will be facing is clock accuracy. So, according to the standard. Uh, clock accuracy of GSM cells must be uh, 50 ppb or 0, 0.00 ppm, which is parts per million um, for macro cells or 0 0.1 for, for small cells um, and for, for pico cells. So that's quite accurate clock. Let's put it this way. So um, this is required if you want to build network with handover, for example. So in practice, if you are doing lab testing with a single base station, uh, 200 uh, PPBs or 400 PPBs, uh, part per billion, uh, that should be OK as long as you don't do handover. Most phones will, will work. Further than that, there is no guarantee. Some phones will work, some phones will not work, some phones will kind of work and then like fail. It's like no guarantee space. The problem is that most uh, commercially available SDRs out there has um, accuracy of 1.2 ppm, which is like an order of magnitude worse. So uh, what this means is that uh, this is basically hit and miss for you. If you are working in the in the laboratory at fixed temperature, because um, clock drifts a lot during um, due to temperature, so if it's fixed temperature and you calibrate it, it may work for a while, may stop working next day. You know, if you're getting on a on a street, it will stop working again. So it's hit and miss, and it will you will also depend on okay, so this this unit works, this unit doesn't work because you know they have different crystals with different initial accuracy. Um, or due, due to manufacturing uh, differences. So, and this applies to all, all user Slime SDRs, Blade RF, so pretty much to, to all of them. Uh, so what to do in this case, uh, you have basically two options. 
or like three options. So first of all, you can use external clock. So if you have another stable clock, maybe from your signal generator in laboratory or just a static clock, you can uh, you can uh, use this as a clock source, clock source to lock on it. Or you can get GPS DO. Um, for example, Atos is uh, selling GPS DO specifically for for their users, and then you have to put antenna and you know get locked to, to lock to GPS signal to to synchronize, or you have to regularly calibrate um, towards uh, using some other external uh, clock source. So um, and. This problem was actually the reason why uh, we started Umtrex project back in 2008, I think, or nine, um, because we were completely stuck with this issue. We created, you know, our own clock. Then we started creating our own SDR, and um, so Umtrex uh, is again the only popular SDR I know of, which has. Uh, clock which is 0 0.1 ppm stability by itself plus gps so you can get uh even even lower to to, to 50 ppb uh with gps lock which means that you won't have this problem at all so uh next thing is clock rate so uh gsm symbol clock rate is uh, 13 divided by 48 uh, megahertz and uh, ideally uh you want to avoid uh, fractional resampling makes signal slightly worse, adds a lot of CPU consumption. Uh, it's not the worst thing ever. For example, user N, even though it has a 50 megahertz clock, which is, requires fractional resampling, still generates a good signal. And many people are using it uh, in, in their labs. Um, better to have integer. So again, if you are uh, choosing something for your experimentation, better to have uh, uh, something like Umtrix or uh, B200, which has a flexible clock rate, so it adjusts uh, to, to your requirements. Um, another two points. First of all is interface. So uh, there are three interfaces um, for the different uh, software-defined radios. First is uh, USB, which is like user PB200 and LIME SDR. Uh, there is Ethernet, it's uh, Umtrix and uh, different versions of USERPs and PCI Express, again, for upcoming districts. So USB is very handy when you are doing you know, like development and especially, specifically if you are doing, using your laptop when you are like moving, so you just plug in and you know, it works, it's very nice. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there's a lot of issues with USB if you try to run it in production for like for month of runtime, just various, various issues with USB. So, um, that's why, again, Ethernet is much more handy if you are doing uh, something uh, long run related. Um, output RF power, another popular question. So people are buying SDRs and they're like, oh, like my SDR is not covering more than a you know, like couple of meters. So what, what do I do, right? Um, so first of all, a thing to, to note is that uh, there are very low power SDRs. 10 dBm is basically 10 milliwatts and some of them even go lower. So B200, E300, Lime SDR are all on, uh, in, in, in this ballpark. And there are uh, SDRs which have uh, higher power. So again, uh, Umtrix, user PN200 have higher power. So with low power, you'll get like, I know, like few meters, well, less than 10 meters, definitely. Um, with these guys, you can get like 100 meters, 200 meters, depending on configuration and then whatever. So. Um, radio front end. Another thing uh, to keep in mind when talking about radius is like the coverage is what is your radio front end? Because um, again, this is just you know 100 milliwatts out of here. So um, and even if you have 100 milliwatts, in some cases you don't need duplexer. Uh, in some cases you do need duplexer. So oops. Uh, what uh, what is the plexer? So the plexer is device which actually combines transmitter and receive signals and separates them. So to make sure that your transmit signal is not blinding your uh, your receive signal, because uh, if if you have too strong uh, transmit signal, uh, your receive your, your receiver will listen to all this noise and will not be actually able to receive. Um, uh, uh, low power signal from uh, from phones. So 
if you are adding any power amplifier, duplexer is basically a must for you. And another thing, um, and the LNA is low noise amplifier, the same on the receive side. So this is ties back to what uh, Harold was talking about the um, uh, the path loss calculations and uh, uh, how it's called the sensitivity and and, and all the stuff. So uh, this is what affects it, right? So and this is how it looks like. For example, in our base station, so uh, this is our base station, uh, like inside. So this is the SDR, this is the PC, and uh, these are two power amplifiers because it's a dual channel base station. So the power amplifiers, and this block is um, is low noise amplifier plus duplexer. So you can see that. Uh, so this cable is going into like from the SDR into power amplifier. So here it gets out of power amplifier, amplified, goes into uh, into here, and then goes into the plexer inside. And this is antenna. So uh, so from TX it goes to antenna here. Then on the other way it gets from antenna inside, goes to here. This which is receive port, and then go through like low, low noise amplifier here, and then into um, into the SDR, so that's uh, that's how it looks like. Uh, yeah, the same the same picture, uh, like layered. So <coughs> uh, another reason why you do care about duplexers when you're putting amplifiers is that. Uh, you should filter out all the noise you will be producing in the spectrum. And I request that if you put an amplifier, don't put it into operation unless you have good equipment to check that uh, you actually filtered out all the noise. Because this is look, this is uh, this is a signal which we, um, for example, uh, transmit at uh, what's that, 826 megahertz, which is uh, I think in 850 uh, band for um, for uh, North American GSM band, and as you can see, th this signal uh, also has the second spur at 2.4 gig which will basically completely interfere with your Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, like whatever you're running in 2.4. So unless you filter this out, this will be in in the spectrum and uh, it will be high power. The difference between one and two is only um, 10 dB. So if you are putting, you know, like 10 watt amplifier, uh, you will be uh, like one watt at, uh, at at this, which is like a lot, so please don't do that. <coughs> uh, okay, so now um, to the actual, yep. Okay, so to the actual configuration. So, um, well, actually, you can read all of this in in the <laughs> in the documentation. But basically, basically, there are very few parameters: receive gain, transmit attenuation. Again, we are. So I think attenuation, not the power. A max delay is uh, the basically radius of the cell. Um, everything else is not so important. These are the parts which you have to really care of. And MS power loop also um, make make sure you are doing this right. So uh, Osmo TRX has no VTI, no file configuration, only command line options. Um, but in most cases, you just need to. Um, you can just run it with uh, um, no parameters or any minimal parameters. Minus G just enables uh, GPSDO uh, lock for uh, for for USRP. Otherwise, um, it's it's very straightforward to to run initially. If you want more channels, specify minus M. Uh, with B two hundred with with B two hundred ten with no M because it's already dual channel, and that's basically it for for now. Again, slides will be published if you want to read them more in more details, you are welcome to do so. 
Okay, thanks. Um, slightly. Uh, do we have questions? Again, we are slightly behind schedule, so but still one or two questions I think we can take. Okay, so just about the the Blade RF, does it? I believe mm -hmm. that works with Yate BTS, right? Which is is that a that's my that's, that's my understanding because we with. also so so um, yeah. So basically, Yate BTS. So initially, Osmo TRX is a fork of code from Osmo BT uh, from uh, Open BTS. So Open BTS transceiver was forked, and uh, we created Osmo TRX and added much more features, optimizations, and whatnot. Uh, so Yate BTS has another fork, um, but I guess the code base is kind of compatible. So again, if there is anyone interested in Blade RF support, you can take a look at Yate BTS code and um, try to adapt it to the existing Asma TRX code base. Should be reasonably doable. Hi, just a small question. This is regarding, I think, a 2G. There is some project or some plan to do compatible the Osmo UMTS project with SDR boards? Uh, well, so there is a, a open BTS UMTS, which is outside of OsmoCom project, which is a completely separate uh, open source project. Um, you know, it supports SDRs, like, you know, our game tricks are supported, the user PISA are supported. Um, I mean, you can you can try it. I'm not, it's not very stable. It's definitely far behind stability in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of, uh, sorry, com compared, compared to Asmacom projects. So uh, Thomas wanted to ask something? Oh, sorry. Or comment something? So uh, Thomas is actually uh, the maintainer of Asma TRX. So, <laughs> so regarding the OpenBTS UMTS, my understanding is most of the development on that now is no longer in the public open. Range Networks does is still operating a business there, but okay. uh, they have a commercial version that's internal, and we don't know what the status of that is. So um, for anyone interested, you would have to contact them uh, for that information. Uh, and also speaking from the NS research side, I'm not aware of anyone working or in progress on doing anything in terms of uh, UMTS layer one. So, to the best of my knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. And like my personal understanding is that UMTS is going to die way before 2G and LTE will just take over. So, there's a lot of going activities in for LTEs, there's a lot of activities for GSM. Uh, UMTS is kind of just declining. Thanks okay. for welcome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>